The Truth About You If you want to take control of your life, it's important that you gain a basic understanding of who you are. Our self-image, which is the picture of ourselves that we hold in our minds, becomes the key to our lives. All our actions, feelings, and behavior, and even our abilities, are consistent with this formed picture. We literally act out the kind of person that we think that we are. What we need to be aware of is that as long as we hold on to that picture, no amount of willpower, effort, determination, or commitment will cause us to be any other way because we're always going to act the way we see ourselves. To be any other way, we must first look at how we form our self-image. From birth onward, we collect hundreds of ideas about ourselves as being good or bad, wise or stupid, confident or fearful, and so on. Through repetition, these often false identities harden into our self-image. This self-image either allows us to be happy and successful, or it tyrannizes our lives. Whether we realize it or not, within ourselves is a mental blueprint. It's a picture of the way that we think that we are. This blueprint is exact and complete down to the last detail. This summary or blueprint is our self-image. However, this blueprint is not who we are, but rather who we think we are. The circumstances or conditions that formed our self-image may have been totally erroneous or blown out of proportion, but as far as we are concerned, it's all true. Once we record this information, we do not question its validity. Most of the time, we can't even consciously recall how or where we obtained this information. We just live as though it were true. Even if it's not true, we believe it's true. The vast majority have missed the message that all the great teachers since the beginning of recorded history have tried to share with their fellow human beings. The secret of the ages, the one most incredible truth that very few realize, is that at the being level, which we will call your higher self, you are spiritually whole, complete, and perfect. Just as a drop of water has all the qualities of the ocean, You have all the qualities of the Creator within you. Science, philosophy, and religion all teach in their own way that there's ultimately one power in the universe and that we're one with that power, energy, force, or whatever you're comfortable with. You and I are individualized expressions of all the power of the universe. This can be called your higher self. We can never destroy the higher self within us. We can deny that it's there, we can try to hide from it, we can lie about it, but ultimately we cannot change the fact that it's who we are. What we need to do is to recognize that it is who we are and learn how to channel it through our thoughts. We must understand the distinction between who we are and what we do. Who we are is spiritually perfect, but what we do is not always perfect. The gap between who we are and what we do is created through ignorance. When we don't know that we are spiritually perfect, it follows that our actions will be less than perfect. I'd like you to do something right now. Just say to yourself, I know that who I am is spiritually perfect. Now listen to the little voice in your head. It's probably saying, oh no, I'm not. The affirmation of perfection seriously threatens your ego. Your ego immediately sends back the response, What do you mean you're perfect? Come on now, take a good look at yourself. Look at the way you treat other people. Remember what you did yesterday? You're always complaining. How about the way you treat your mother, your father, your boss, your mate? How about the way you treat yourself? And remember that terrible thing you did back in 1986? How can you say you are spiritually perfect after that? Take a good look at yourself and stop this nonsense. You see, your ego does not want you to take a good look at yourself. It wants you to take a bad look at yourself. It wants you to identify with everything that you're not. It wants you to identify with your actions and feel guilty. It wants you to judge, condemn, and blame yourself for not living up to the pictures and expectations of yourself and others. 
To get out of this trap, simply recognize that it's just your ego trying to trick you. This is not the truth about you. All of this is coming from your conditioning. The way out of this is to affirm your own perfection. It's not an ego trip to affirm your own perfection. It's an ego trip not to affirm your own perfection. Remember, the first and most essential step in changing your life, no matter what you want to be, do, or have, is to realize your own perfection based upon the truth about you, that you are spiritually whole, complete, and perfect. The way to neutralize your ego is to love yourself unconditionally. Loving yourself doesn't bloat your ego. Loving yourself actually neutralizes your ego because your ego isn't about loving yourself. We need to understand that life is consciousness. This means that what we assume to be true will become real for us. Whatever we're conscious of, we will experience. In essence, we will experience in life what we're deeply convinced is so. This statement is important. We experience in life what we're deeply convinced is so. If our thought patterns say, I cannot have this or that, I don't deserve this or that, I'm a bad person, we continue to create conditions that correspond to our ideas of evil, lack, and limitation. The bottom line is this. If we cannot accept ourselves that we're worthy and deserving, then we cannot accept that other people are worthy and deserving and will therefore be in judgment of them. The solution is to develop unconditional love of ourselves and others. This is the only way that we can ever be free. We must have total acceptance of ourselves first and then others, knowing that as we are spiritually perfect, so is everyone else. In a very important way, you've created yourself whether you know it or not. All the character traits, mannerisms, ways of talking, ways of walking, facial expressions, gestures, and even ways of thinking and believing, you have borrowed, imitated, or made your own. It may have been from a parent or others in the household, a favorite teacher, a friend, or a character in a book or a movie. Maybe you borrowed from someone you didn't even like. It may have been from someone who made you feel uncomfortable or afraid. Imitating that person could have been a way of making you feel less afraid and a way of intimidating others. It's important to take a look at the personality that you've created. Perhaps one of the reasons you keep yourself from doing this is because you've been an imitator. It's not uncommon to get hung up on this. It may help to understand that nobody, but nobody, can create a self from scratch. Everyone has to do the same thing. Everybody chooses from what's available. Even though you may have built your personality through imitation, you're not a fraud. No one else has ever put together the exact same combination that you have. Don't forget, there are only 12 notes in the musical scale and yet many hundreds of thousands of unique and beautiful combinations are created. It's all a matter of how they are put together. It doesn't make you any less of a unique person to have taken from others. The wonderful thing about this is that since you put it together from scratch, you can change it at any time you want to. You're never stuck. It's not a disaster to discover that you're not the person that you thought you were. On the contrary, it's the beginning of the end of disaster. In order to change the experiences that are causing you pain and disharmony, it's necessary to begin with a clear understanding that you never help yourself by rejecting any part of yourself. We get into self-hatred because we set up a picture of how we think we should be based on the conditioning from our family, peer groups, mate, and religion, and the society that we live in. The sad part of this is that we'll never be able to live up to the pictures, images, models, standards, or concepts of how we think we should be. It's a psychological dead end. We've allowed our ego to trick us into believing that we're incompetent inadequate, insecure, stupid, bad, evil, and unworthy. All of this can be summed up as poor self-esteem and a poor self-image. Until we make a conscious decision to change our thought patterns, we will continue to have poor self-esteem and a poor self-image. The first and most important thing in your life is self-acceptance. 
to love who you are, to be yourself. Only when you love yourself can you begin to love others. Many people say that you should forget about yourself and love others first. Well, it doesn't work that way. The truth is, you must first accept yourself with all your mistakes, all of your so-called sins, all the times you looked like a fool, and all the times you've acted inappropriately. You must be able to stand before the entire world and make no excuse for yourself. When you can do that, you're coming from a position of unconditional love. How you see yourself creates your behavior, and this behavior creates your environment or your results. When you attach your self-worth to your accomplishments or to your behavior, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. No matter how hard you try, someone is going to think you're not okay. Remember this, you'll always be a failure in someone's eyes. You'll never win them all over, sometimes not even a majority. Take a look at how much of your life is about winning approval and realize this important truth. You'll never get it. You simply can't please everyone, so learn to please yourself and enjoy who you are. It's worth repeating that who you are is spiritually perfect, but what you do is not always perfect. What you do may succeed or fail, but you can detach yourself from the results by remembering that you can never be a success or a failure based on what you have and what you do. There's no way that you can fail in life as a person. You're not set up that way. When you're into hating yourself for all the things that you've done or haven't done, or into hating other people for what they haven't given you, you're into suffering. Suffering is a way of putting yourself down. It's a way of being angry at yourself. If you really get down to it, anger and suffering and lack of happiness in our lives comes from being disappointed in ourselves for not living up to some expectation that we have of ourselves or that someone else has of us. In working with alcoholics and prisoners, I have found that the major cause of their situation is self-hatred. Their self-hatred stemmed from the fact they hadn't lived up to someone else's expectations. Most of us judge ourselves on the basis of what we have or don't have and what we've accomplished or what we haven't. We feel that when we are a failure, we've let ourselves and others down. When we don't come up to the expectations of our parents, employers, religion, friends, or mate, we conclude that we're no good, and this is known as self-judgment. When you're standing in judgment of yourself, you will judge yourself as bad. And as soon as you put yourself down for something that you have or haven't done, or something that did not work out, or for a situation where you disappointed someone else, you feel bad. Yet this type of judgment only serves to carve away at what little self-esteem you have. It never does any good. It only destroys. It's true that each and every one of us has things in our lives that we regret. But at some point, we have to stop dwelling on the regret and move on. We have to learn the lesson and throw away the experience. We can never be for anyone as long as we are against ourselves. To be against others is to be against ourselves. This is a spiritual and psychological truth. The most corrupt thing that we can do is to judge someone. To suppress another individual and take away another's aliveness is one of the most negative and self-destructive behaviors a person can have. What would happen if you had no regrets of the past? Try to image what would happen if you totally forgave everyone in your life regardless of what they did to you. Hopefully you are beginning to see that to the degree that you cannot forgive, whether it be yourself or someone else, you perpetuate unhappiness, poverty, sickness, lack, and limitation in your life. Many people don't want to forgive others. They say things like, why should I let them off the hook after what they did to me? The enemy is always someone we think can harm us or take something away from us. But the truth is, no one can harm us. People harm us through ourselves. Actually, they don't harm us at all. We give them instructions on how to treat us, and they just follow through. Make a decision to give up all resentment right now, because in the end, it will eventually destroy you. 
Yes, you say, I agree with you, but you don't know my circumstances. They really did hurt me. I'll give up my resentment next week, but I have a little more getting even to do. Understand that this type of mentality is more destructive to you than it is to the person that you resent. Turn your attention to this idea. You cannot be wealthy if you resent wealthy people. If you resent talented or beautiful people, you cannot be talented or beautiful. If you resent thin people, you cannot be thin. Whatever you resent is a statement of what you lack. When you resent, you cannot be healed because through your resentment, you literally cause your own sickness. Remember, whoever you resent is you because we're all one. The more you love and support other people in being who they are, the more you will have of everything. Rather than resent people who have what you don't have or do what you can't do, take the time to learn from these people. Be with masters. Be with people who know how life works. Admire them, acknowledge them, and support them in having what they have. And as you do that, you actually support yourself in having what you want. If you study philosophy and religion, you will see that values, morals, and principles are often rooted in the belief that something is better than something else. A is better than B. Don't get caught in the trap. Forget about the way you think something should be done or how someone wants you to do it. Instead, just be yourself and do it the way you feel it should be done. About 700 years ago, a great teacher ripe with years and honors lay dying. His students and disciples asked if he was afraid to die. Yes, he said, I am afraid to meet my maker. But how can that be, the students and disciples responded. You have lived such an exemplary life. You led us out of the wilderness like Moses. You have judged between us wisely like Solomon. Softly he replied, When I meet my maker, he will not ask, Have you been Moses or Solomon? He will ask, Have you been yourself? The story shows that throughout time, people have struggled to be themselves. Why are we still struggling? The struggle comes out of our need to please others. By assuming your own destiny, you're bound to get someone angry, your boss, your spouse, your parents, your children, but in time, they will adjust. At first, assuming your own destiny can be a lonely process, and it may seem that everyone is against you. But the only image you must live up to is your own. The opinions of those who can cheer you on or hold you back are irrelevant. The decision to live your life is your own responsibility. The results of your own life are your own responsibility. Your action or inaction becomes your own responsibility. Some people's conditioning and beliefs are in conflict with yours, and when they see someone living in opposition to their values and beliefs, it can be very frightening for them because, in a way, it threatens their own foundations. They feel that if you're right, they're going to have to give up some of their own beliefs and change. When a person is confronted with your beliefs, there's an inner battle that's waged, and the battle is... Could they possibly be right? And if they are, that means I could be wrong. A person who knows who they are and loves himself or herself unconditionally is not threatened by the beliefs of others. It all goes back to developing a high level of self-esteem. Let me ask you, do you like yourself? Do you trust yourself? Do you keep promises that you make to yourself? Do you think that you're a good person? Are you yourself most of the time, or have you developed an act to cover up who you are? If you had a friend who treated you like you treat yourself, or talked to you the way that you talk to yourself, and broke commitments to you the way that you break commitments to yourself, do you think you'd keep them as a friend? Let's face it, you probably wouldn't want that type of person around. It's very important to take a look at the way we treat ourselves. Most of the time, we are our own worst enemy. We are afraid to meet our inner selves because we think we may not like what we see. A person says, I want to explore myself, but I'm afraid of what I'm going to find out about myself. I'm afraid of the strange creatures that I may find along the way or along the journey. Understand this clearly. It is absolutely impossible for the truth about yourself to cause fear. 
no matter how terrible the truth may be, it is powerless in itself to either frighten or harm you. Fear is caused by resistance to the truth and by misunderstanding it. Start your journey of self-discovery at once. Nothing but good can come from it. The understanding of fear cures fear. Don't get hung up on the kind of person that you think that you are. Don't concern yourself with whether you're better or worse than other people. Instead, try to know yourself as the kind of person that you are. If you look at a half-finished house that you're building, you don't condemn it for its unfinished condition. You don't say it's inferior to another house, nor are you concerned with its appearances. All you do is realize its need for additional work. Adopt this way of thinking toward yourself. Whatever your present condition, just realize the need for more construction. Be patient with yourself, but be firm toward the necessary work that needs to be done. When you're an expert on yourself, you're an expert on everyone else. A conscious person knows himself. He knows his own nature, and therefore he knows everything about other people who have the same nature. Know yourself as you are, and you will know others as they are. Never be afraid to expose a weakness in yourself. Exposing a weakness is the beginning of strength. Remember, everything you learn about yourself is good news. No matter how difficult or surprising it may be, it's always good news. Keep this in mind, especially in times when a new truth clashes with a belief that you know you must abandon but are reluctant to do so. A wise person is willing to give up a pebble in exchange for a diamond. Have the courage to do this and self-change begins. Self-worth comes from self. That's why it's not called other worth. If your worth comes from others, you'll never love yourself. You don't have to have permission from others to change your life. Don't ask, is this right for me to go against everything that I've been taught to believe? Instead say, let me see how much intensity I can put into my search. Your own desire for personal freedom is the only search warrant you will ever need. If you're really going to learn the truth about you and live your life as you're capable of living, a lot of people aren't going to like it because they're not committed to the same path as you are. Are you going to deny yourself riches because others are poor? Are you going to deny yourself health because millions of people are sick? Take a good look at what you're denying yourself and don't ever think of yourself as wrong for wanting what you want. As we move along the path of self-discovery, we're bound to make mistakes. Those so-called mistakes, faults, sins, or errors are not you. Make sure you separate who you are from what you have and what you do. You transcend what's happening in your life as you come to the realization that what's happening in your life is only temporary and will always be changing. It's important to understand that your higher self is changeless. When you identify with your temporary nature, you take on the belief that what you have and what you do is the real you. It's possibly the biggest error that you can make in life. To experience your own magnificence requires that you separate what you have and what